Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is Kyle Cleveland with Temple University's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies for a podcast here with Horiguchi Sachiko and Ozone Sachiko, both whom are doing a very interesting research project on how medical doctors in Japan are dealing with the COVID crisis. My colleague, Horiguchi Sensei, is a cultural anthropologist at Temple University Japan. She has a PhD from Oxford University, and her background is in social and medical anthropology. She teaches courses on youth, cultural diversity, ethnicity, and she also has a particular research focus on youth mental health issues. And her doctoral dissertation was about hikikimori, or socially isolated people who are socially and culturally maladjusted. Also deals with issues of multiculturalism, and she has combined work with her colleague, Azone Sachko, who's at Scuba University, who's a practicing doctor, um, works at a local family medical clinic and also at the university hospital and teaches students in clinical clerkship when they're looking at local level doctors and how they're responding to the crisis. It's a very unusual project and I think will be of interest to a lot of people because we often see media reports but have very little sense of what's actually happening among practicing physicians. Horiguchi Sensei, can you tell us a little bit about what your research project is focusing on? Yes, this project is indeed unique. Um, it was launched mid March uh, this year after the outbreak of COVID 19. And we are unique in the sense that we bring together a team of five medical professionals who are already engaging in research on general practice and family medicine and five anthropologists. So it's a collaborative project. And we have been conducting a series of Zoom interviews with primary care doctors all over Japan, uh, working at the front line in dealing with COVID-19. Ozone-sensei, as a practicing physician, how has your research project come together and what methodology are you using to address these issues? We've been conducting a first individual research to family physicians all around Japan. In Japan, family physicians work in many different places, not only in clinics, but sometimes in hospitals or university hospitals. So we kind of picked up physicians who belong to different places and in different regions because the outbreak of COVID-19 was very different among Japan. For instance, in Tokyo or Osaka, there was many more patients, but in other countryside places or rural places, not much uh, patients were, we, we didn't have much COVID-19 patients. So we kind of picked up different physicians in different facilities and in different regions. And first we did a individual interview where we had one interviewer, uh, interviewee and maybe two, one or two medical professionals, and one or two anthropologists gathering in the interview. And then we uh, did a one interview and took one or two months, and we interviewed the same interviewee again. And that time, we kind of paired a one or two physicians in different places or different regions so we could make more communication with other people well, that sounds like a very interesting and also very complex research project because you're pulling together all of these physicians who must be very busy in their daily work, and then you have anthropologists looking at this. How are you able to, to work out the process of being able to do something meaningful with these people who have such different life work styles? Horiguchi Sensei, could you talk a little bit more about the research methodology and how it came together? Yes. So as Ozona sensei uh, was explaining, we basically started with individual interviews and then moving on to sort of pairing up. And the point here is that we don't just want to kind of follow the individual narratives, but also um, by pairing these people up, we can kind of really highlight perhaps differences and variations uh, that we find uh, in various institutions uh, as well as various parts of Japan. And we also give the opportunities you know, for the physicians to talk to each other and maybe ask questions, have an idea of what's happening sort of uh, in other parts of Japan. As Ozone Sensei was explaining earlier, in urban areas, the number of infections are pretty high. Uh, so when a doctor from an urban area talks with a doctor uh, who's based in a, in a rural part of Japan, 
uh, they can kind of see the different ways in which they're dealing with it. And especially perhaps from the perspective of the doctor in the countryside, then okay, they'll be able to kind of foresee what to expect, for example, uh, later. I think one doctor mentioned uh, something like a time machine okay, that seems like in every area, a similar kind of path is followed, but in different timings uh, because of uh, the the different levels of the spread of the infection. Uh, and I think by pairing uh, these doctors up, okay, we're able to kind of really bring out that kind of, I think, conversation. And basically, the doctors are the ones that lead the interviews. And that's quite important because many of the medical professional members of our research group are familiar with uh, the doctors that we interview. They might have met each other in conferences before. They have might worked on maybe projects uh, together before. I find that the primary care professionals in Japan are very well connected um, with each other. So they've exchanged um, information over time, too. And I think... The fact that we have uh, medical professionals on our team that are very familiar with the doctors that we interview, I think really sort of uh, is an important way to really sort of ask in-depth questions. And also the medical professional members are also doing clinical practice, also uh, teaching uh, students, uh, working in different institutions like university hospitals or local clinics and so forth. They themselves share their own kind of uh, concerns and practices and so forth in the course of the interviews. And that really, I think, helps us get the kinds of voices that would be hard for uh, anthropologists uh, themselves. We anthropologists uh, might not be able to ask such well-informed, I think, questions. Uh, so I think that's crucial uh, for uh, the project to be successful in the way that you know, we're finding, I think, at the moment. Mm-hmm. What is the trajectory of the research project? Do you envision this going on for an extended period of time? Ozone-sensei. Yes. At first, we didn't know how long it will last, uh, how long will this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic will go. Now, I think we kind of re- a little bit resolved right now, but we have concerns that this will go on. Maybe second pandemic will come or second. third. Yeah. Yes. So right now we can't see how long it will go, but as long as this disaster is lasting, maybe we have to continue this for a year or a year and a half. Horiguchi-sensei, you were saying that there were pre-existing relationships among the doctors consortium had been established. And then as an academic, you came into this having a background in medical anthropology. So what's the nature of, like, do you have weekly meetings or do you communicate by email or how are you able to coordinate the activities of, of such a complex array of professionals who have, I imagine, extraordinarily busy schedules? Uh, that's a kind of that's a big challenge, of course, you know, for I think all of us. Uh, the interviews tend to take place in like on weekday uh, evenings. Um, it's often the case that let's say we start interviews at uh, 9 p.m. in the evening <laughs> after uh, the work uh, the doctors um, on both sides, and I think might have been done. Uh, I think some doctors are at work uh, during that time too. So I think that kind of, I think, shows you know, how busy, especially, I think, medical professionals are. Uh, but we have, I think it's because we also have uh, team interviews. I think that makes it easier to make sure that the interviews do happen at the right time. Okay? Um, basically, the medical professional members uh, really uh, arrange uh, for the, meet, the interviews, sorting out uh, the schedule and so forth. We come together to do the Zoom interviews. Now uh, we've moved on to focus group interviews, the uh, paired up uh, interviews. At this stage, uh, and you have like set teams okay, uh, working with uh, the focus groups. So now I think we're doing maybe interviews twice a month uh, on a regular basis. But before, it was a little bit more chaotic. I, for example, uh, might be uh, participating in the interviews a couple of times a week. And yes, we understand that, of course, the doctors are quite busy. But at the same time, some doctors that we have interviewed, I think, have appreciated the opportunity to talk out you know, what they're doing. And we ask them like how things have changed over the course of the last month, for example. Uh, and then they're able to reflect on how things have changed and so forth. And at this stage, they're also able to exchange uh, information and share concerns uh, with colleagues using Zoom, uh, being able to communicate with people from all over. So, yeah, we have also heard voices about how uh, they appreciate uh, the 
uh, opportunities, you know, uh, TV interviews as well. And you know, I have huge appreciation uh, for everyone, I think, you know, who's really sort of made time available uh, for the interviews. I think many of the participants in the project, both on the side of our teams and also um, the research team and also uh, the interviewees also have families. Some of them, sometimes we hear sort of maybe voices of their children uh, in the back uh, when they're doing interviews at home, for example. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, uh, I think that's the kind of, I think, uh, setting okay, that we're in. But the members, the research team, basically do Zoom meetings um, among the members on a regular basis. I think once in a couple of weeks. Now, I think we've kind of settled down too. So uh, it's, I think, moving on to once in almost a month, uh, perhaps uh, now, but it used to be much more frequent in the beginning of the research project. And we would talk out uh, what kind of issues we've had so far, also making suggestions on uh, how to go ahead with the project. Um, uh, we've also had really interesting discussions about maybe different ethical standards uh, that medical professionals and anthropologists might have. Uh, so we have been doing everything on Zoom. So in fact, I have never met uh, Ozone Sensei in person, uh, although we have been you know, part of this project you now for uh, quite a long uh, time already. Mm. I find it comfortable. Um, uh, a very already, different way of uh, doing ethnographic yes. research where usually yes. you have a specific site. And in this case, mm-hmm. it's all being done virtually. Uh, maybe you could both address this question. I presume this is a continuation of previous research and there's a foundation that this is built upon. Could you talk about the roots of this? And I, I guess this has slowly come together and coalesced into this more focused research project. But can you tell us the background of this in a little more detail? Yeah, so if I perhaps might continue. Yeah, uh, so the project itself does build on the collaborations between medical professionals and anthropologists that we've had already. The idea was first, um, the idea for this particular project uh, was proposed uh, by anthropologist uh, Dr. Shuhei Kimura, who is at University of Tsukuba, uh, the same university that uh, Ozone Sensei uh, is based at. And he had already uh, worked with colleagues, uh, medical professionals, like Ozone Sensei uh, before in a different project. Um, uh, So there was already a kind of precursor uh, to the project, and this was the ethnographic uh, project in clinics and so forth um, that Ozone Sensei was uh, talking about earlier. And because I think speed was important, but especially I think Dr. Junji Haruta, uh, who is kind of the leading member of our team, really, I think, got this going very quickly. Within a few days, we were uh, meeting on Zoom, and then uh, just setting up the project yeah, and Haruta Sensei uh, really got on uh, to write kind of proposal so that uh, we can get through the ethical uh, committees um, quickly. Uh, and then yeah, the project uh, was kind of, I think, accepted uh, by the Japanese Association for, uh, I think, Primary Care Association. So it got going uh, very quickly, I think, in a matter of maybe a week or two. But that was possible because uh, mm-hmm. there were earlier projects uh, that were was happening at the University of Tsukuba between uh, the medical anthropologists and the medical professionals. I, for example, was participating kind of in a different project with some of the members uh, in this team. And this was basically a project uh, where we wanted to kind of bring in uh, anthropological insights uh, into the training of uh, medical professionals, whether uh, at the level of clinical practice or perhaps an earlier stage for medical school students. Uh, So there was a kind of bigger uh, team um, of anthropologists and primary care providers who had worked on workshops together uh, writing. Now, I think we're, I think, finalizing uh, a kind of textbook uh, project for bringing anthropology into medical school and so forth. So within Tsukuba and also outside, okay, there were uh, quite a lot of you know, collaborations going on amongst us. And I think that's kind of culminated in this in a particular project. Mm. And we could speed up the process because we knew, I think, each other as well. Right. Ozona Sensei, what kind of questions or issues are you addressing as you're interviewing these primary care physicians such as yourself? Yeah, we have been asking questions regarding how the interviewees is, are experiencing this change in the practice or their family life related to COVID-19 and how they uh, get information about the COVID-19, for example, by either by internet or the report that the government presents from the um, SNS communication within the medical professionals. 
So now that you've been involved in the research for a while and you've been doing these interviews, and even though it's still at a relatively early stage, what insights or patterns are you beginning to see in the interviews that you've conducted so far? How much the COVID-19 is spread is very different among regions, and it very depends on how the local region has the the case count. I'm sorry. The <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. If we have many patients who are infected or suspected to be inf- infected by COVID-19, we have to do so many things like wear PPE or isolate patients who might be having COVID-19. But in areas where there's no report of new COVID-19 patients, they don't really much have different ways, created different kind of practice as you compared to usual times. Very depends on the region where they are practicing. Ahoroguchi Sensei, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, yes. I think one, one of the very important sort of, I think, findings from this project is this sort of diversity. So as I was saying earlier, one doctor called it a kind of time machine, but it's so different, I think, depending on where you are. And of course, doctors being also residents of the community, what's sort of What's the climate and what's, what's the context uh, immediately around them, of course, becomes very much part of their clinical practice as well. Uh, so I think that context is very important. And, and so it's really difficult to talk about, like, how is Japan maybe dealing with it uh, in this sense? Uh, because, right. like, every region and is quite different. But also the difference can be also at the level of different institutions, too. And clinics, local clinics might have a very different role from, let's say, local hospitals. And there are also differences between university-based hospitals uh, and uh, local hospitals. Some hospitals which accept uh, COVID-19 patients uh, would have a very different experience from hospitals which don't. And within the hospitals, uh, too, there's also a lot of variations there. So basically, we're interviewing primary care professionals who kind of do general practice. So they're kind of on the mode of accepting any patient that really comes in, whereas maybe some of the more specialized uh, doctors that are perhaps based in local hospitals or university hospitals, they might not always care that much about COVID-19. So there are also like differences among the doctors, uh, the medical professionals, about how the attitudes and how they're thinking about uh, COVID-19 and Mm -hmm. different types of specialism and professionalisms might also play a part. And then we also find that, of course, doctors are working with other medical uh, professionals like nurses uh, and social workers and, and so forth. And especially for doctors in local clinics, making sure that that their staff are not burnt out, for example, and also making sure that the staff are provided with adequate, accurate uh, information to get the practice uh, going is also quite uh, important. So there are a lot of kind of, I think, like maybe variations and differences as, uh, at different levels uh, that we find. And the size of the clinic, the size of the hospital also, I think, affects how they might deal with the need for zoning uh, and so forth. How many patients there are, of course, and affects um, how, how they have to arrange for these, at what point they, they start these. So there's a lot of, I think, diversity uh, that we find. Although I think you know, the ones that we have interviewed are, of course, you know, very much committed uh, to working uh, with uh, COVID-19 and also serving uh, the community uh, that they're part of. This, I think this sense of serving for the community might be something that might be, I think, important uh, for uh, the doctors in primary care, but that might not always be shared you know, with the other staff in the hospitals uh, mm-hmm. and so forth. Well, you've mapped this three-dimensionally in a very impressive way, given the fact that you have all these different levels of organizational structure and then also the various cultural differences. Uh, Just to stick on that point for a moment, Azone Sensei, as you look at different regions or different parts of Japan, what meaningful cultural differences do you see in the way COVID is being addressed, either in the way in which the doctors organize their work or the relationship between doctors and medical authorities? The cultural difference? You're dealing with this at various levels of institutional structure between local clinics, larger hospitals, and the kind of physicians that are dealing with this, some of whom I presume are not specialists in infectious diseases. But you're also seeing that regionally there may be cultural differences. Can you discuss the extent to which 
cultural differences are having an impact upon the way that doctors address the crisis? I was really impressed with one doctor who said about how their community thinks about the COVID-19. It was where in that community, there were no uh, COVID-19 patients at that time, but they had the feeling that they don't want to be the first one to have the infection. If they have the infection, because the community is very small, they'll know that person has the COVID-19 and that will make them very difficult. And that kind of sense was same with the doctor working there in a small community clinic that they don't want to be the first one to diagnose the COVID-19 or the one who get infected. So they were very careful not to have themselves being infected, for example, not go to uh, cities Well, is this reflected in the numbers? Because one of the issues with Japan's response is that, like other Asian countries like Singapore, South Korea, it seems that Taiwan, it seems like the case count in Japan is extraordinarily, almost implausibly low. And that seems to be, you know, Japan's doing very well with this. That's very impressive. But is it possible that the dynamic that you just mentioned is resulting in an undercount where people have the disease, but... They don't go to the doctor unless they're very ill, or perhaps even doctors, they deal with it without registering this in the official numbers. Could this be a reason for why Japan has what it seems to be a low case count, but in fact might be much larger? That's very interesting. I don't think the doctors are, are hiding or not reporting the numbers because they know that it, that will make a very big disaster in, inside the community. Maybe especially in rural areas and more old aged people, they are very careful on how not to see other people or go out so much. I do have the feeling that they don't come often to community clinics as often as they do regularly. They see even if they have a small cough or runny nose, usually they come to the hospitals or clinics immediately, but they stay at home for one or two days to see if it gets uh, well soon. So the number of the people who come to clinics is decreasing, but still people who become very ill come to hospitals. I don't think we're not, uh, we're counting the number low. It seems that maybe one of the strategies here, and I don't know if it's necessarily a, a doctor's strategies, but rather just the nature of Japanese society and the way people are very conscientious and also practice social distancing very well, is that they don't come to the doctor perhaps until they get really sick. And so the asymptomatic cases or the mild cases are not showing up in the statistics. I'm not too sure if that's really the case. I mean, I think the number of outpatients in a lot of clinics and local hospitals after the outbreak of COVID-19 has declined dramatically. And now I think you know, some of the doctors working in local clinics are worried about, uh, are getting, I think, worried about their business now, which shows that I think they used to have a lot of patients, I think, coming in. And maybe because uh, the medical insurance system. The insurance system is quite well developed in Japan, especially maybe usually among the older people, you know, and also with children who might you know, have minor kind of symptoms because the cost can be covered. They don't have to pay much. Uh, I think they actually do ac- tend to access quite often. But under COVID-19, I've heard many times from doctors that especially the pediatricians are having a difficult time uh, because there are much fewer children coming to consult. I think that the clinics in the usual state would be having quite a few patients with minor symptoms. You can call an ambulance for free in Japan. So um, I think required think, a lot of perhaps restraint in our, I think, you know, observation, learning about uh, COVID-19 to, uh, I think, stay at home without going to the doctor uh, and so forth. You know? And I think, I mean, in urban areas, like let's say around Tokyo, you know, I think when the numbers were becoming very, very high, I think we have heard of cases where the doctors were, were almost quite sure that this might be COVID-19, but perhaps um, the PCR testing uh, didn't go through. But 
I mean, for them, it's just that they just uh, do their best to treat the patients and you know, send them to the right places. Uh, the PCR test might come or not, but uh, I think you know, they're just do- doing their best to treat the patients as needed. And if they find page patients that are too anxious and not maybe necessarily at risk. It's their role to, I think, uh, say that, well, you, know, um, you, know, you, you need to take a rest. Uh, you can always come back right. to us um, and so forth. So well, I think many of the doctors by now who have really dealt with quite a lot of cases uh, suspected cases of COVID-19 are starting to have an idea of like uh, what to look for right. and so forth. They can kind of see what COVID-19 patients look like, sort of. I think yeah. they have kind of a, an idea of that. So if they suspect that, they would do whatever they can to offer the treatment and that's needed by the patients. Um, right. I'm not too sure if that's bringing down, of course, a number of PCR tests, but I think they, they know very well the capacity of PCR testing, I think, and that's, mm-hmm. that could be available in the community, right. which can be right. very different from Korea, Taiwan, or uh, yeah. Singapore, because like um, Japan didn't experience SARS outbreak before, not very well, I think, prepared. Uh, so I think the doctors are very aware of the limits and the like the capacity uh, for PCR testing right. but the under the circumstances yeah. i think they do provide the best care so i think the death toll also remains very low you know, i think which is i think one probably right i think work. one of the issues that you mentioned there is very important that doctors have long standing pre-existing relations with their particularly at a local clinic level that allows them to make more subtle and nuanced evaluations and assessments. Just projecting from my own experience, I have a clinician here where I live in Yokohama who's bilingual. He worked at Presbyterian Hospital in New York City and was a visiting professor at Columbia. And I've come to know him quite well. And in the early, very early days of this, I went in and I had had a bronchial infection and I was concerned. And we talked for a while and he said, well, Kuribananda Sensei, I think you're suffering from two things. You're suffering from a mild case of bronchitis and you're suffering from anxiety and you just need to kind of relax, right? So I see this among doctors in Japan. A lot of what they do is what we call bedside manner, like really care and empathy and the way in which they talk to people. And then as the case rate amplified some months later, I asked him, if you don't mind, you know, I don't want to be rude, but could you tell me how many people in your clinic have had COVID? And he said two. And we talked about that for a minute. And then he said, now ask me how many people have actually had it. He had sent two people to the hospital. And he said, now ask me how many people have actually had it. And I did. And he said 50. And I said, well, how do you know if they have it if, if you don't test it? And he said basically inferential diagnostics that he knows their background, he knows their pre-existing conditions, uh, whether or not they have like comorbidity issues of high blood pressure or obesity or things like that. You know, there's a, a very long record of their visits there at that local clinic. And so that relationship is really important. And he was very confident that he could evaluate whether or not people had COVID without doing the technical test. So we're getting into here into some of the cultural differences. Can you talk a little bit about, I guess this is in line with presumption of a Japan model. When people look at the COVID crisis in Japan, what do you think they don't fully appreciate or understand um, in terms of how the Japanese medical system is addressing the crisis based upon your research? Ozone Sensei, can you speak to that question? What do most people not fully understand or appreciate about how Japan has been addressing this crisis? Yes, one thing is many of the people, the Japanese people, is very much affected by the media, especially TVs. And they learn from TV information that how they should um, avoid getting infected and not to go to doctors so much. And I think that is a very good part. And on the other hand, what is what many Japanese people might not know, especially old age people that I see uh, in the clinic, or maybe the many of the in- interviewees that we have talked, say, is that not many Japanese people know much about how it's going on in other countries where they have much, much more uh, patients dying or being infected. And sometimes the medical system is, has gone down and Japan is not in that state. And I don't know if the patients 
understand that Japan is doing pretty well. And we, as a family physicians or primary care physicians, understand that Japan has a universal coverage of insurance and that the system is working very well. But maybe Japanese people or the patients take it for granted that they have this good system and that right. it's working right. very well. They have faith in the system, right? Which is certainly something different than what I see in the United States, where people don't trust elites and are defiant of authorities. Well, Horiguchi Sensei, could you speak to that issue a little bit about the cross cultural differences of? Yes, um, and I think it's important to kind of look at these differences.、Uh, I'm not too sure if I can call it a cultural differences. You know,、uh, I think. There's this kind of myth that anthropologists are specialists for like cultural analysis, but I think it's actually more productive to look at like look at these maybe differences in numbers and so forth, not in terms of like let's say you know like very culturalist kind of ideas about like why you know people like in Japan people wear masks、uh, kind of thing, you know there's social distancing,、um, this kind of obedience to authority. I think these are really sort of fuzzy、uh, cultural ideologies、um, that. But, uh, of course, might be strong in Japan, but not really explaining what's happening. And I think it's really important to look at what's what actually, for example, the doctors are doing, what kind of health、uh, care system、uh, they're working in, what kind of relationships they've built up over the years,、um, and more of the kind of and also the social economic circumstances the citizens are are in. It's I think it's very important to kind of stay away in some ways、uh, from very sort of culture oriented、uh, kind of stereotyping、right. uh, type of analysis, which I think can be quite strong from Western centric. I think the、yeah. problem with speaking in terms of culture is it applies to everything. So you know the yeah. the yeah. nature of the hospital, the size of the hospital, the bureaucratic structure,、yes. all of those know, are cultural、yeah. aspects. But the way in which we're talking about culture is kind of. As an ideology, as a mythology, can you address the culturalist explanations and what's potentially problematic with that? Yeah. So,、um, so for example, when of course, like in a lot of Asian perhaps uh, countries, uh, wearing masks masks、uh, has been quite common. But rather than looking at that as a kind of cultural stereotype of some sort, I think it's important to look at you know, how it's developed. Maybe perhaps the flu season, the systems around the influenza outbreak in Japan,、uh, how a lot of people I think go to clinics to get diagnosed for the flu and so forth. That also I think leads into perhaps this wearing a mask. And of course, you know, there's an industry behind this. I think it's important to look at the economics behind these things, rather than saying that well, Japanese pre- people prefer to wear masks. And rather than pointing to, for example, the social distancing, perhaps Japanese people might not really hug each other or kiss each other much. I mean, rather than pointing to those types of cultural differences, probably it's very, it's more important maybe to look at you know when. The outbreak started. How it came in. When people started responding to it, I think in the West the response was just very late. I read an article that pointed to that、uh, right. by Doctor、uh, Iwata Kentaro,、uh, who I think got on Diamond Princess ship earlier on.、Okay. But for example, like you know,、um, the lockdown had to be done in a lot of Western countries, and Japan has not done lockdown. And I think there was a lot of criticism that came. And this was kind of explained through the obedience to authority kind of culture. But rather than that, I think it's important to look at the legal differences. And also, probably、yeah. Japan did not need to do a lockdown because they dealt with it earlier,、uh, for example. So I think it's important to look at the practices, you know, what, what's happening both at the clinical level, which we are looking at, but what kind of system they're working in. And I think some doctors, for example, have pointed to not just the long-standing relationships with their patients、uh, in the community that they have served, that really I think played a very important role in making things work, but also their own relationships with the local medical community, for example,、uh, in every sort of region in Japan, their doctors, you know, aso- societies, associations, and you know, if they collaborate well, if they have collaborated well in the professional community too, then you know, they can come up with good results. Responses,、um, good guidelines. They can arrive at a kind of consensus on how to get going and so forth. This is also, of course, a cultural thing. And rather than using this sort of you know, idea of collectivism you know, as something ingrained in Japanese culture, I think it's important to look at how they have kept it going in, in, at the institutional kind of levels、mm-hmm. and how that's played a part. Clearly, obviously, culture is at work here in various ways. Sure. But I guess it's、um, you might say it's a necessary but insufficient explanation. There's a lot more going on than just that. 
So mask wearing, social distancing, respect for authority, all those things are kind of maybe trivially true and overly obvious. But in addition to that, there are a lot more things going on. And that's why your research is compelling, because you're able to get inside the medical institution and the way primary care is done. And that's something that most people really don't have access to. So with the physicians that you've been interviewing and interacting with, in their clinical practice, how are they dealing in terms of the technical aspects of it? Or do they have a proper amount of equipment? Are they properly supplied? And do they feel like they have personal protection equipment um, at a sufficient level to be able to do their work? Azoni Sensei, as a physician yourself, how do you feel, how well prepared and supplied are the doctors in dealing with this crisis? I myself and many of the doctors I interviewed, many of us are not very prepared at all. And in what so, ways? In what ways? Many of us didn't have much supplies of PPE equipment yeah. or how to make distance with patients or isolate patients who are who may be infected and who are not. And also, we didn't have any guidelines we can rely on. So we had to get information ourselves and construct a way that map the way where we work. Institutions have different kind of environment. So we had to figure out a way to keep ourselves safe and also the patients safe in different ways. And we didn't have this universal way of doing so. And the information we had changed in maybe daily basis. So we have to adapt to that and make new guidelines to the ways that we can manage to do it. Well, I suppose in some ways that might have been beneficial because by not having a kind of top-down directive coming from a governmental body like the Centers of Disease Control in the United States or the World Health Organization internationally, it essentially required local physicians to take ownership and responsibility of the response in coordination with each other. So I think from what you said previously, primary care physicians like yourself are part of a social network of other physicians and you consult with each other. So together, did you build a response? Yes, I think primary care physicians had the advantage of collaborating with other professionals because we've been doing that before this COVID-19. So maybe that's because we are maybe doing it better than other more professional or specialist doctors. A lot of the doctors who are dealing with this, I guess, are not infectious disease specialists. They're not epidemiologists. So how are they able to deal with such a distinctive medical condition when they don't have the background or or training or have not dealt with a lot of cases of such disease previously? Yes, now many of us are not infectious disease uh, specialists. And maybe one thing was that some doctors, especially the um, clinic doctors, had the experience of dealing with how to um, manage the new Influenza disease. Seasonal influenza. Uh, no, the... You mean H1N1? Like, 2009? Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. H1N1 swine flu? Yeah. Yes. So we prepared for that disease uh, before. And we kind of had that image that how we can uh, gather information. And then there was also SARS. This is uh, the second iteration of SARS, right? So yes, prior to yes. H1N1, you had SARS. And these, these broke in Asia. So I guess you had experience with that previously. So sometimes the local cities or towns had that experience. So they kind of knew uh, what to prepare. And some some places had guidelines they made, which may not be um, used for this COVID. But we were kind of prepared for disasters, maybe. Mm. And then those become applicable in this crisis. Yes. I imagine, like everyone else, doctors themselves are worried with patients coming to them on a daily basis that could expose them to the infection. What are some of the psychological effects of the pandemic doctors have to deal with on a daily basis? Maybe, Zona, as a physician yourself, could you address that question? One thing was that I realized that physicians are those who have to take a risk being infected themselves. And also, um, from the interview, I heard that many doctors are isolating themselves from their families in order not to get their family infected. Throughout the entire crisis? 
They, well, some doctors are, yes. Uh, it's not, not like not they that, can do it for two weeks because they're right. continuing to see patients. So they have to stay away from their family for an extended period of time. That's remarkable. Yes. Some doctors do that. Or sometimes the doctors go home and take all their clothes off when they go inside the house. And they just get naked and go straight to the bathroom to take a bath before they meet their families. So that kind of ritual has changed. And maybe some, sometimes that's a big stress for their uh, for physicians. Sounds very traumatic. Haraguchi-sensei, yourself, your research is really branching into social psychology. I know your, your doctoral dissertation on Ikikimori. Could you talk a little bit about the psychological aspects of this on physicians and healthcare providers? Yes, I think as as long as Sensei mentioned, there's I think a lot of psychological burden on the doctors, especially uh, those who have dealt with COVID nineteen directly, sort of that they've experienced psychological fatigue and burnout. Uh, especially, I think in April when I think the numbers were going up, we've heard of, from some doctors, you know, experiencing very high level of uh, stress. And I think as Ozone Sensei mentioned earlier, the doctors are dealing with something uncertain, like you know, something new. So that adds, of course, to the fatigue. And uh, so in, in response to this, some um, one doctor that we interviewed went on to ask for more, more doctors to work together in more frequent rotations rather than like you know, having a long rotation. Uh, so that alleviates uh, the workload and also psychological burden. So there's that, I think. And also, the doctors are also frustrated sometimes with the colleagues, local hospitals, clinics that don't really deal with it because they kind of take over that job. And there, yeah, that also leads to the frustration uh, because not all doctors are kind of on the same line, uh, kind right. of trying to deal with it. Uh, and that you know, that's and that I think also isolates the doctors um, certainly too. Um, and also, of course, you know, they might, uh, as Ozone as they mentioned, they might have to kind of distance themselves uh, uh, somewhat okay, from uh, their family to protect their families. But I think many doctors also joked about it, too. So I could kind of see how their family relationships um, have been quite intact, too. Uh, as they go through this difficult period. So it's not like because they, they have to sleep in a different room uh, for their other like family members and the children. It's not like they are totally kind of isolated. I think there is a kind of intact uh, family bond that they probably have developed already. So they can kind of joke about it, I think, too. But one of the, I think, things that really struck me, and I think that uh, I think many of our members have been struck with, is the really flexibility of the primary professionals to really say, of cope with something new. They're really able to adapt to new situations very quickly, very flexible. And I think that's really been interesting uh, to observe how the the primary care providers seem to really adjust themselves to the new normal, whatever, uh, that they have to, like, of course, add a lot of zoning things, um, meet new patients, new types of patients. You know, deal with you know, all these different uh, new things. They have to cope with all the fear, uncertainties, and so forth. But they're very good at kind of adapting themselves you know, to the new situations. Also, they because things change so quickly, they're yeah, when we do the longitudinal kind of interviews and try to catch up with what's what's happened over the first like last month or something, they find that things have changed so much and they can't even really sort of remember it. And that's how well adjusted I think they are to the new situations. And, and I think that's also really helping uh, them. That's kind of a maybe a sort of resilience that they've always had, but. I think that's kind of helping them deal with uh, the very stressful, right. psychologically right. like you know, difficult situation. Mm. Mm. Well, much of what you've said today is very insightful. I, maybe this is covered in the Japanese media, but I haven't necessarily heard a lot of this because we look at this from kind of a great distance and can't get inside the patient-doctor relationship and what's happening in clinical practice. But the media coverage of this, obviously, in Japan is very different than in other countries, particularly the United States. But what are the practitioners' views of the way the media have covered the crisis? And to what extent are they willing to engage with the media to talk about what they're doing within their practice? Ozone Sensei, do you have any contact with the media or is that something that you avoid? Well, one of the doctors, I think, talked about how they got on the team or maybe uh, to the media but was very disappointed that what they wanted to say was 
very different from what was presented as a media. And I think it was about the PCR that the doctor intended that not everyone has to take the PCR because it could mask, it could diagnose the disease in a wrong direction where the patient really has the COVID-19, but it goes, the PCR goes negative. But what the media showed was that um, the PCR is not very appropriately done in Japan and we have to do more PCR testing. And that was not what the doctor wanted to say. I have the feeling that um, we have to be very careful what the media wants and what we want to say is very different. Yeah, I guess testing has become so politicized that it becomes a metric for whether or not people think the government is fulfilling the responsibility and addressing the situation adequately under the assumption that more testing is better medicine. But what you're suggesting maybe is there's ambiguity within the testing. There, occasionally there's false positives. You have people who may be asymptomatic that you don't test. So testing is part of it, but maybe not enough. So Horiguchi Sensei, what's your sense of the interface with the media or the lack thereof among the physicians in Japan? So I think, I mean, a lot of doctors have talked about their engagement with media. And I think, for example, they have learned about COVID-19 from mass media, just like any other perhaps person. Um, so that could be like the first kind of like news on COVID-19 that they have come across because like patients are exposed uh, to what mass media, especially like I think older patients right. might be really you know, are watching TV shows, mainstream like press, which might be quite sensationalizing. And so, so I think some of the doctors are concerned about the impact uh, that the media reportings can have. Because, for example, the mass media would keep saying like there's not enough PCR testing. Uh, and then the patient, I think, gets worried and um, comes to seek help from the clinicians uh, and so forth. So they're really, I think, concerned. And as Ozone Sensei was saying, since some of the doctors, I think, in, uh, including, I think, one doctor who is kind of an expert on infectious diseases, too, and has appeared on TV news and so forth, but also expressed some concerns about how it gets edited. I think this is a kind of uh, ubiquitous issue, not just about doctors, but uh, they're under that kind of yeah, but they also, I think, uh, some of the doctors who used to like appear on, I think, media even before COVID-19 broke out. So, for example, like local TV kind of shows, you know, they had that, those connections. They know, you know how to, I think, make things work um, and they know how they can effectively use the media to educate the public about what should be done. So I think some, you know, uh, some have figured out ways to kind of, I think, do this in a kind of constructive way way. And I think in recent, some of the recent interviews this month, because maybe the, the kind of first wave has uh, seemed to settle down, uh, a lot of uh, doctors, uh, I think, get uh, asked quite often, it seems, about uh, not really about a kind of diagnosis and you know, symptoms and so forth, but more about you know, how you, know, you can keep the workplaces, sh like workplaces, schools, preschools and so forth, safe. And they're invited to advise on that kind of thing. And they also might do similar kind of recommendations and suggestions about how citizens uh, should protect themselves. And that's kind of an area that they're increasingly, I think, invited to perhaps uh, talk about either through media or more directly, of course, to the community. It's kind of seem, it kind of seems like the role is perhaps perhaps slightly changing, uh, perhaps from before. Mm. Yeah, but, but many of the doctors are also, uh, I think, in not such an older generation, maybe 30s, 40s. And uh, yeah, they're very good at using social media too. So when they want to get reliable information, they would know where to kind of look at SNS from colleagues that they trust, like other doctors and so forth. And then they try to pass on um, the knowledge in from uh, existing research or uh, reliable sources to their staff members in the clinic, as well as I think uh, the mm -hmm. patients that they deal with. So you're midway through this research project, and this may extend for a considerable amount of time, but how has your understanding evolved from this, and what have you learned that you didn't know initially, and how has this changed the way you've viewed it? Azona Sensei, how has your understanding evolved as you've gone through this research project? The one thing was the very difference in uh, what we are experiencing depending on the facilities we are in or the regions we practice. On the other hand, um, there are some many similar things that we are experiencing. And what helped me the most was that 
I found it that I was not the only one who is going through this disaster and having a hard time how to manage consultation with patients in a safe way. Right. Maybe in a way that was different from what I, I have learned from medical school through and training. So that that makes uh, that is very important for the safety of the patients and ourselves. I got to know uh, many ideas. I found that primary, as Dr. Horiguchi said, um, maybe primary care physicians are good at adapting to new things and making changes. Also, I found that many patients are moving to seek for primary care physicians instead of going to big hospitals for a cold, common cold, but rather they go to their um, own community's clinic. And also, if they're not that very sick, they don't go to the doctor, but they do try to do a self-care. So maybe the way the patients are moving or the how we can um, provide care to as a primary care physician is going to a rather better way than it used to be. But that kind of change has happened. I found that that kind of change is happening. Well, however difficult it is, it seems to be working when you look at the Japan compared to other countries. Horiguchi Sensei is a cultural anthropologist. I'm sure you have a slightly different perspective and you're not necessarily down inside the medical system per se, but are getting an echo of that through these interviews. It's just such an interesting research project to have a collaboration between primary care physicians and academics who are together kind of meeting in the middle on this. So from your vantage point on the outside looking in, what have you learned that is most compelling from this research? Yeah, I think one of the things that, that has struck me is, I mean, how committed uh, the primary care, I think, providers are uh, to the community, uh, to the citizens in the community that they serve. And uh, of course, I mean, yeah, you've mentioned that Japan seems to be dealing with it. Uh, well, I think it's a little bit early to make the assessment at this stage, too, because it's still, I think, ongoing, of course. And also, compared with maybe other Asian countries. I don't think Japan's death toll is that low either. So I think you know, it's also important to maybe you know, uh, overemphasize the success at this point. But I think the, you know, uh, whatever like political decisions are made, you know, I think the, the I think the capacity of the uh, existing kind of medical care system, which is very much I think supported by the primary care physicians, I think uh, that we have interviewed, really sort of I think sh- it's showing its strength sort of I think in a way at the moment. I think there are also of course a lot of concerns around you know, uh, again like their businesses, for example. I think that's a new kind of I think newly emerging concern. But as Ozone Sensei was saying, maybe you know, and I think some doctors doctors have mentioned that, well, you know, it's maybe good that not too many people go to the clinics because maybe too many people used to come. So maybe citizens are learning to take care of their own kind of, I think, health right. without maybe relying too much. So maybe we are kind of moving into a kind of maybe new good direction. And I think it's quite, I find it quite fascinating uh, that un- under such a difficult struggling time, doctors can say something about that, like in terms of long-term, how uh, this can bring uh, something good uh, in the long run. Although, of course, I think at the everyday clinical level, it's all quite hectic, quite chaotic, I'm sure. Lots of uncertainties um, that they're faced with. And I think they are very much prepared for a very long battle of a few years or even longer. I see the project, of course, going on for a long time. I think we've like our members have discussed how we should also look at post-COVID-19 to see how things kind of unfold um, after things settle. And I think it's really sort of, um, it's been really sort of, I think, fascinating to see how the the power sort of of the primary care doctors uh, to, I think, Mm -hmm. um, deal with the current situation. As an anthropologist, again, like I want to avoid, again, a culturalist analysis of things. And I think it's a privilege uh, to kind of get to see what's happening uh, at the ground level, direct voices, uh, as it's happening, sort of, we call it documentation, but we're kind of documenting as things go. And it's very difficult to catch that in retrospect. And I feel really privileged you know, to be able to sort of see what's happening here and now, uh, kind of, uh, as we go along. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm sure that the insights you know, that we get uh, from this project will probably replicable uh, for, of course, other maybe upcoming crises or it can be useful, right. I think, for mm-hmm. other dealing with you know, other types of, I think, um, health crisis of, of some sort. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I feel quite honored to be part of this project. Uh, it's so interesting. I mean, I've learned a lot in talking to you before this recording and from this uh, discussion here today. 
I don't think it's a perspective that most people have access to. Of course, you know the work of the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, who makes a distinction between what he calls experience near and experience distant learning or understanding. And so this has both because the primary care physicians are obviously experienced near hands-on. And then the anthropologists and academics are just enough distance that maybe they have a different perspective, a different vantage point from which to evaluate it. So thank you for the work, and I encourage you to continue. It's something that I I think is important, and it'll provide a lot of insight. So, you know, we look forward to your updates and and, uh, maybe as your research, hopefully, if we get out from under the cloud of this COVID in a couple of years, and you've started to make some more definitive conclusions, uh, we can revisit this. But in any case, I, I really thank you today, Ozona Sensei and Horiguchi Sensei, for your time and your insight. I know you're both extraordinarily busy. And Ozona Sensei, be safe in your clinical practice. Take care and thank you for teaching us about this. Thank you so much. Tori Aizu, thank you so much for joining us. This is Temple University of Japan's ICAST through the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. If you'd like more information and to see our previous archive of events, look to the ICAS website, and also we have an archive on YouTube with previous events. Thanks for joining us today.